Counter Narrative, where we explore stories that challenge the norms and inspire change. I am Rehanot Ojo Oba, and with me is the incredible Tiara Loa Oluwa Bukumi Fade. Hello, everyone. Today, we're excited to have an incredible guest, Lita on Fincher, an American journalist, feminist, and author known for her impactful works on gender issues in China. Dr. Leita is the author of Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awakening in China, and Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. Leita's first book, Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China, was named one of the top five books of 2014 by the Asia Society's China File. And the release of the 10th anniversary edition of Leftover Women, early review of books described the book as powerful and provocative. New York Times Sorry. New York Times book review says, later on, Fincher's Leftover Women offers a chilling account of the pressure on Chinese drivers. One hopes that leftover women will soon be translated into, chi- into Chinese as it is likely to resonate deeply with urban educated women. It seems the party has forgotten the male era dictum women hold up half the sky. Welcome to the counter narrative, Dr. Leita Hong Fincher. Good to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. We're going to jump right into it. Our audience are very curious. In your research and experience, what are the two myths? What are the two myths perpetrated by incels and misogynists that are that aren't supported by data? Uh, are you talking about the misogynists and incels in China? Uh, well, I mean. Pretty much everything that they say, um, and this has been going on for many years. Um, I would say that in, in my book, uh, Left Over Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China, it, it focuses on this propaganda campaign that was started by the Chinese government in 2007, and they were pushing the term Shengnu, or leftover woman, to define a single educated woman who's 27 years old or older. And there is a lot of propaganda that is widely spread across China's social media, all of its state media, state newspapers, television, um, that it's extremely insulting and misogynistic, shaming these women for staying single and saying that they need to hurry up and get married or no man is going to want them. And so, um, I mean, basically what I've found in, in the research that I did years ago, and then and also I, I did a full update of the book, um, and this book is gonna come out in just a few days for the 10th anniversary edition of Leftover Women. And it shows that um, the Chinese government is really behind a lot of this misogyny. It's not just natural in Chinese society. Um, just this notion that women have an expiration date and the expiration date is actually in their mid twenties um, or by the time they're 30. And I can get into all of the reasons lying behind that misogynistic propaganda. Um, but I mean, there are just so many myths around it um, that some, some of which are kind of universal, but, but some of them are related to unique things in China, like for example, the sex ratio imbalance, where you have um, around 30 million more men than women in China because of a decades long policy, a one child policy where um, a lot of parents, and this was government policy as well, um, committed abortion of female fetuses or even female infanticide. Um, and so all of those really egregious violations of women's reproductive rights have resulted in this huge gender imbalance. And there, that creates a, a huge new demographic crisis for the government. Um, but we could, we could talk more about that, but the misogyny is really everywhere. So your preface in The Leftover Women, you mentioned how the Chinese government refused to, um, to issue you a journalist visa, inspired the book. Can you share more about that? Well, it wasn't so much, yeah, the, it wasn't so much that the 
denial of a journalist visa inspired the book. It was really that I had been a long time TV and radio journalist in China. And um, I had gone to the US and I was working in the US for a few years. And then I had two young children and I had um, married. And so our whole family was gonna go back to Beijing and I was sponsored by, um, at the time I was working for Voice of America News, and they sponsored me for a second tour as China correspondent. And my husband also was a journalist. So in order to work as a journalist in China, you have to get a special journalist visa from the Chinese government. Now this was in 2009, and I was waiting for quite a few months for my journalist visa, but my husband got his visa first. So we decided to just go to China on his visa. And so we took our two young children and I was still waiting for my journalist visa and I thought it was gonna come through, um, but I was waiting and waiting. It was almost a year and I still hadn't gotten it. And so I had to think about something else to do because I wasn't allowed to legally do reporting in China. So I then started a PhD program in sociology at Tsinghua University in Beijing. And this is where I got really interested in my research on China's real estate boom and how it was very heavily gendered. That is, um, that when Chinese married couples or even boyfriend and girlfriend went to buy a home, um, and there's this huge real estate frenzy and all young people were all very strongly pressured into buying a home that um, it was very heavily gendered. And I, I started to encounter um, a lot of young women who I discovered had handed over their life savings to their boyfriend to finance the purchase of a home that was supposed to be the couple's marital home but then the home didn't have the woman's name on the property deed. And at first, when I, I heard about this for the first time, I thought, wow, you know, why would such an intelligent woman allow this to happen? Why would she agree to hand over her life savings to a boyfriend um, and, and purchase a home without her name on the deed? And, but then the more interviews I did, the more I discovered this was incredibly common. It was very shocking to me. And so I did more research into um, the phenomenon. I did a lot of interviews with young women and men. And this is where I came upon the, the widespread term leftover woman because so many of these young women I interviewed said, well, I'm at that age, I'm in my mid twenties or I'm already in my late twenties. Some of them might've been in their very early thirties. Most of them were still in their mid to late twenties. And they said, you know, there's a lot of pressure. I, I need to get married because if I don't get married now, then I'm going to be a leftover woman. And um, that's how this whole huge research project and this brings me to my next question. The concept of the leftover women is quite prevalent in Nigeria and Africa. Do you think that there is a link between traditions and the idea of marriage and family being a woman's, great, being a woman's greatest achievement, especially compared to the Western countries? Yes. I mean, I have certainly, since this book first came out in uh, 2014, so it's been almost 10 years, um, I have been approached by a lot of women from around the world. It's definitely not just China. Certainly other young women in Nigeria as well um, have reached out to me as well and said, you know, this stigma about being single as a woman is really strong where I live. And, and it's, it's very strong in a lot of countries. I mean, in fact, even, you know, I live in America, I'm in New York. And just the other day, in America, a major American newspaper came out with an editorial saying that America has a marriage crisis. There aren't enough young people getting married and that women are supposedly better off if they're married and have children. Um, so this is not 
a problem certainly that is unique to China. Um, but getting back to your question about the culture, there are some countries with an incredibly strong patriarchal tradition. Um, and China is one of those countries where Confucianism is the traditional philosophy um, that is extremely patriarchal. It's, and for centuries, you know, it was these Confucian beliefs that um, women were subordinate and that um, basically as a daughter, you had to obey your father. As a, as a young woman, you were supposed to get married and then you were supposed to obey your husband. And as an older woman, uh, as a mother, you're supposed to obey your son. It's very strictly hierarchical. And this is in part of Confucian ideology passed down through the centuries. Um, now, what I discovered in my research was that actually this kind of patriarchy in China today is not so much historical tradition as deliberate Chinese government propaganda coming from the Communist Party propaganda apparatus. Because China's history is unique because of its communist revolution. Um, in the years leading up to 1949, um, there was this civil war and there were the communists fighting the nationalists. Um, and so the Communist Party at the time, especially in the 1920s, right after the Communist Party was founded in China, um, they were actually very feminist. They used feminism as a rallying cry to recruit women to the communist cause. And a lot of young women joined the communist revolution because, not because they believed in communism, but they wanted to be free of their families in many cases. They wanted to be free of this pressure to marry and have babies and lead a very traditional life as confined to the home. Um, and so communism was a radical break from that. And then in 1949, the communists won. Uh, Mao Zedong founded the People's Republic of China. And really, that Communist Party completely overthrew traditional society. And um, in the early communist era, era I mean, Mao, one of Mao's most famous sayings was women hold up half the sky. And so the official policy of the Communist Party in the 1950s and 60s, all the way through the end of the 1970s, was women all need to work. Women need to go into the workforce. They also need to be assigned managerial jobs. And so uh, this was seen as urgent and important for the Communist Revolution to build this new nation so that women could contribute to the industrial development of this new communist nation. So that's what is so fascinating about what's happening in China is that China's own communist history completely overthrew the traditions of patriarchy and sexism and Confucianism. They completely revolted against those traditional beliefs. And so as a result, China had probably the highest female labor force participation rate in the world. And what's happening today, what has been happening for more than 15 years, ever since 2007 in this leftover women propaganda was disseminated by the Chinese government, has been a new complete about face by the Communist Party, which today is heavily male dominated. And there's a strong push uh, particularly coming from the new leader, Xi Jinping, a very strong push to get women to return to the home and assume these traditional roles of dutiful wife and mother. Wow, that is, you know, that is something that's going around in the world right now. Like we're regressing. There's, there was this, there was this um, speech by the UN secretary about how we're regressing and how things that were like, Things that were that were there for women before 
like women's rights and all of that are being overthrown. They are, we are being sent back into the old, into the old times. And it's just, it's just really, just crazy. It's just really crazy. So, um, so on the eve of International Women's Day in 2015, Chinese authorities jailed five feminist activists. Eight years later, how has the growing voices of women in China amidst fears of oppression improved the lives and well-being of women? Yes, so um, I actually wrote quite a lot about what happened in 2015 with the jailing of five feminist activists who became known as the Feminist Five in China. Um, and that was my previous book, Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awakening in China. And that marked a huge turning point for the Chinese government's attitude towards feminist activism. Because until then, there really wasn't a feminist movement that was discernible. It wasn't a movement. I mean, there weren't enough people taking part in it. There were maybe about a hundred feminist activists who were doing regular kinds of protest performance art, they called it, on the streets, um, drawing attention to things like domestic violence um, or gender discrimination in universities or sexual violence. On the eve of International Women's Day in 2015, the Chinese police in several provinces did a huge round of arrests of feminist activists and the, the, the feminists were planning to celebrate International Women's Day by handing out stickers about sexual harassment on subways and buses. That's all they were planning to do uh, for International Women's Day, but just they didn't even get to do it. Um, just before International Women's Day, the police rounded up all of these feminist activists. They focused on five of the feminists brought them all to Beijing, put them in the same detention center. And um, that move really backfired on the Chinese government because, you know, at the time, I believe the government was trying to wipe out a potential feminist movement in China by sending a warning to other feminists by jailing five of them. But it backfired dramatically because there was so much outrage among other, not just feminists, but the LGBTQ plus community. I mean, all sorts of people, uh, young people in particular, were really outraged. Um, they couldn't believe that these five young women, you know, were jailed just for planning to celebrate International Women's Day. And so there was, that I believe was the birth of a true political feminist movement in China where more and more young women in particular, but also LGBTQ plus young people were uh, speaking out against discrimination and inequality, were starting to use the term feminist, Nu Qian Zhu Yi in Chinese, on their social media handles. And then, so then you began, there, there, there was this beginning of a real clash between a ground up feminist uprising of sorts where a lot of women, young women in particular, were increasingly uh, speaking out against sexism and then the Chinese government trying to censor feminist discourse and persecute feminist activists. And there began a big crackdown on feminist activism in general. And that started in 2015 it's still going on today. It's developed in unexpected ways. And I have to say, I was surprised at first at how resilient China's feminist movement was. Um, and today I think it's very, very difficult for the Chinese government to suppress this movement. I mean, it can jail individual feminist activists, um, but it's, really difficult to just try to get young women in particular to stop believing in feminism. And this is something that I talk about in the updated version of the book as well, um, in Leftover Women, is a huge difference in the last decade 
um, is that you have so many young women who say they don't want to get married or have children. And what is the government going to do about that? Because um, the birth rates have plummeted for, for uh, many years. Marriage rates have fallen for nine consecutive years. This is perceived as a huge demographic crisis for the government. And it has a lot to do with feminism and young women embracing feminist beliefs. Speaking of so many young women not wanting to get married, even in this part of the world, we, when you have conversations with young women, when you touch the marriage subject, so many young women are not interested. And when you probe for that, even without probing for that, in the line of our work, we, we, we have conversations around femicide. We say that, oh, IPV is on their rise, intimate partner violence, femicide. More husbands are killing their wives. More ex-husbands are killing their ex-wives. So we're saying that, see, it's not to say that women do not want to get married, but if it's going to be oppressive, toxic, or abusive, then there is no point. So many women would rather remain single and just stay strong in their singleness until they see someone that makes sense. But then you wouldn't know until you get partnered with the person. And even when you partner, you can only hope and pray that you do not get killed in your sleep. It is so scary. And in this discourse, it looks like, oh, it's because you're feminist. You do not want a man. And women are saying, no, it is just that we just need so many men to learn to treat women better with dignity, kindness, kindness, respect, and compassion. And just let women voices be heard. If we're advocating for ourselves, it's not to say that we, there's a hate on men. It is just to say we want to leave a world free of violence. So really, that was really, that was really a lot from you. That was so bulky, really. Thank you so much for that. And this brings me to the next question. That's why more women becoming breadwinners. They are still, they still bear the brunt of domestic responsibility. So how can society address this to prevent married women from breaking under this heavy load? Well, you know, this is a long-standing question <laughs> for centuries. I mean, um, it's very difficult. The, the, what, what is important is that you have institutions. You need to have institutional government support for women's rights in the home as well as in public. And so those kinds of, if you're talking about, well, let's just talk about uh, intimate partner violence or domestic violence, you know, you have to have um, government support for victims of uh, intimate partner violence. So that if, you know, I mean, of course, it's not just women who are victims of violence, but it is women are the vast majority of victims of this kind of intimate partner violence. And um, if you don't have anywhere to turn to for help, um, then there, I mean, then you're, it's really hard to say what to do other than, um, so you need to have, um, I mean, in addition to just having a law saying that victims have rights, you, you have to have the laws be properly enforced. With the case of China, the government passed an anti-domestic violence law that was enacted at the beginning of 2016. This was widely heralded as a landmark in uh, legal reform for China. And feminist activists had been advocating for this for actually about 20 years. But unfortunately, this law has basically not been enforced at all. I mean, it's just virtually impossible for women in China who are victims of intimate partner violence to get a restraining order uh, against their abuser. Um, this became a really acute problem during the pandemic because the Chinese government had a really draconian system that it called a zero COVID lockdown where uh, people were basically imprisoned in their own homes. In many cases, they weren't allowed to leave. Sometimes they weren't even allowed to leave their own apartment. Often it was they weren't allowed to leave their apartment compound um, without a permit. And under those circumstances, the domestic violence anecdotally really skyrocketed and it was just 
so difficult for victims to escape their abusers because their abusers are in their same family, you know, in the home. Um, so this, and in fact, this is again a, a, a more severe problem in China in recent years because the Chinese government introduced something called a divorce cooling off period in 2021 that mandates that couples who want to get a divorce have to wait at least 30 days uh, before their, their case is going to be heard. Now that doesn't sound like much, but when you add it up with all of these other measures from the government, basically making it extremely difficult for women to get a divorce, even when their partners are very abusive, this is a really bad, ominous development and it effectively traps women in abusive marriages. Um, so that's something that's very ominous that has developed in the last few years in China. But getting back to, you know, more mundane things like, you know, women um, having the lion, traditionally having to bear the lion's share of household responsibilities, taking care of the baby or babies, you know, um, doing most of the housework. These, it's true that these are cultural customs or historical or traditional, but these kinds of um, gender division of labor within the household are being strongly pushed from the top, from the Chinese government itself through propaganda. And so, you know, what do you do when all the propaganda coming from the government is telling you that it's a woman's natural duty to be a good wife and mother in the home and to take care of the family and take care of the household? I mean, this is, uh, this is something that a lot of young women in China are really pushing back against. Um, but you know, when, even when it's not explicitly being pushed by the government, this is still universally around the world. We tend to see that these are highly gendered patterns and the solutions, they have to be institutional and systemic and the government has to be involved on some level. Um, I mean, I can give you another example of women's participation in the workforce. Now this is something where uh, in East Asian countries like Japan or South Korea, um, those two countries have had very low female labor force participation rates for many years, but especially in Japan, the government identified this as a problem for Japan's economic development. And so the government introduced, this was under previous uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and they called it womenomics, these measures to try to encourage companies to hire more women, to get more women into the workforce. Japan has actually been able to raise the female labor force participation rate somewhat. I mean, it still has work to do, but contrast that with China, that's not happening in China. The Chinese government if anything, Xi Jinping, the ruler of China today, has just come out and said, women need to return to the home. We need to focus on marriage and childbearing. This is a woman's duty in the new era of China, which is under Xi Jinping. And so it really bodes very poorly for women's rights in China. But as you rightly said, this is um, a problem that we've seen in many countries around the world. Um, there has been some progress, but there's also been a lot of regression. And China is one of those countries where women's rights have not noticeably deteriorated. And this is the direct result of Chinese government policy. Okay, how do we help women? How do we as a society work together so that women can, because women are taking uh, the bulk of the um, chores in the house and they are also working regular jobs where they bring in money. I know of them are even breadwinners. So they come, they go to work, come back home, come home to cook, 
take care of the children and all of that. So you, you mentioned that the government has to be involved in in helping women in this case. But are there other means that we can we can fight against this? Yes. Well, of course, you know, if you're in a relationship, if you're a married woman and, you know, you're unhappy with the division of labor in the household, of course, as, as a woman, you know, you would want to talk to your partner about it. I mean, of course, there are same-sex households as well, and there's going to be a division of labor in same-sex households as well. But it is traditionally male-female households where the woman tends to take on most of the household labor. Um, and so, of course, I mean, everywhere women are speaking with their partners and saying, you know, why do I have to do everything? You need to do more. Um, and of course you need to have a willing partner. If you don't have a willing partner, you know, well, you, it's really difficult. And so in that case, you know, you might want to consider divorcing. And this is why if the government is making it really difficult to divorce, then you're kind of trapped in that situation. But this is why I said that there has to be a systemic solution because just for one individual, one individual to speak up and try to fight for her rights is exceedingly difficult. What you need is all of society to support you in many different ways. So you, you know, you could have friends who support you. Um, you, you can have government regulations. Um, you could have things like um, a government saying that there is uh, mandated parental leave or mandated paternity leave. And if you don't take the paternity leave, then you, you lose all of those parental leave benefits. Because, I mean, these are really tricky questions because if you only have maternity leave um, coming from the government, maternity leave, that's only for women after having a baby. And that has a tendency to reinforce these highly gendered uh, patterns of division of labor where it's seen as the woman's role to take care of the baby and to take care of the household. So you have to have all of these different policies that support a woman's ability to go back to work after having a child. And, and this is where the problems become especially acute, is after having a child. Because before you have the child, you know, the division of labor inside the household tends to be more evenly distributed. It's not as highly gendered. It's after having the baby that um, women start to suffer a lot more and maybe drop out of the workforce or you know lose the promotion. And this is where the rest of society comes in. This is where government policies come in. You know, you need policies such as free or heavily subsidized childcare or free heavily subsidized pre-K for children. All of these kinds of benefits, health insurance, you know, um, food programs if, the, if you're too poor to be able to feed uh, your, your kids when you're at work. All, th there are just so many different social and government policies that are needed to kind of uh, break down all of these gendered barriers and the, the gender gap um, in so many different areas. Um, but it, as an individual, what can you do as an individual? This is where, um, you know, if you're not married yet, um, as a young woman, then you can do what a lot of young women in China are beginning to do. Millions of young women in China are saying, you know, I don't need to get married now. I don't want to marry now or I don't want to have a baby now. And they're coming under intense pressure from their own parents, their elders, um, who are putting very heavy pressure, making them feel really guilty 
as though they're not honoring their parents or they don't love their parents if they don't get married. Um, and, and a lot of young women feel this pressure very deeply and, and then they'll say, okay, well, I'll marry because I don't want my mother, I don't want my father to suffer so much because my staying single is causing my relatives to suffer. But that's simply not fair. It's just not fair for, for the young woman. Um, but as an individual, this if you're not married, this truly is the best thing you can do for yourself. If you don't want to marry, you know, don't. And don't have a baby. Because, and you do need to be aware that once you marry and once you have a baby or more, you know, it's more and more difficult to extricate yourself from all of those really tricky, very heavy layers of gendered oppression. Um, it's very, very hard. And so the earlier you start to recognize how sexist and misogynist society is in general, and then you try to make your own individual choices, bearing that in mind, you know, the, then, then you'll have a little bit more protection. So in the Left of Our Women, you discuss how women in China are starting to reclaim the term leftover. And is there a point where women should refuse certain labels? Because we've had to reclaim a lot of slurs in the past. Is there a point where women should start refusing and, and fighting against these labels? Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I was just pointing out that there are a lot of women in China who don't use the term shengnu or leftover women at all. Um, and they don't want to use it because they say this is too sexist, I'm not going to use it. Um, I was just really pointing out that, that there are also a lot of women who make fun of it or who, you know, repurpose it. Um, as, as, a, as a symbol of pride. And, and I think that all these different forms of resistance are all valid. So it just depends on the individual. I mean, but I don't think that, you know, I, I think that it's great that there are also women who are rejecting the stigma of being single by using the term leftover women in a way that, you know, that indicates that they're resisting. So it, it, there are many, many creative ways to rebel against that kind of stigma. Okay. Yes, that, that makes sense. Thank you for that answer. Because some in, in, in a society like us, when a woman insists on being single, she's seen as stubborn. She's seen as someone that does not want to contribute to the society because when you get married, you expect to have children. So if you're saying that, you know what, I want to remain single, they ask questions like, are you saying that you don't want to have children? They, they remind you that if your parent didn't have you, you not you're not going it. to be here. You know, and women are saying that I see the workload that my mother, my aunties have done. And it's mostly women, girls that helps with children or more than men and fathers. And so many girls are saying since I was 15, 14, I have been raising my nephew, my niece, my neighbor's child. And I'm, I am burnt out as a child. So having to say that if I get married, I would have to have children. It means that there'll be continuity in the domestic and childcare. And women are saying, no, I do not want to be part of this. And when you say that it is, oh, you uh, the, the, the attack is bitter feminist. I'm oh, like, yes. no, it's because there is no equality in partnerships. And when you were talking about maternity and paternity leave, so many women will say that, oh, they do not even they want their want partners to leave. come yes. to be on paternity leave because they, they if end up caring for the newborn yes. themselves, the husband, and the yes. bulk of the child. So there's so the gender inequality is really one of the leading causes of women saying, you know what? I'd rather be single. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Women, women are so many women are tired. So many women and girls. You could be you, you're single and you're seeing what the, the amount of chores. As a single person, you'll do lots of chores. You now say to yourself, add one child, a grown-up man another child then another and you're just like ah, at what point is this going to end and in a society like ours and i know so uh, uh, another part of the world as well there's some trust that when a man does 
they, they, they say that for it. yeah or they say it, it feels like you're emasculating the man like mm-hmm. why should your husband do this and we're saying so many women are called breadwinners for some reason so many men want women their wives to ease their burden but when it comes to domestic and child care it should strictly be the woman so the conversation is what can you tell a single person that will make a game right? Like, convince me in five seconds, and then you see that so many people do not have what to say. It is just chores and chores and chores, and so many men refuse it to say, I will not do this. It is your job. It is your job. But when it comes to finance, you want me to help you. It's so unfair. It is so unfair. It really oh. is. <laughs> those, I mean, those are the kind of conversations the, that we have, really. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, I mean, um, <laughs> a, a lot of young women in China are also having those conversations now and saying, you know, this is why should I get married? I mean, I mean, there are so many, uh, young women. I mean, you know, I keep talking about China because that's where I did my research and, um, and it is very pronounced. I don't really feel in America that there is as strong, um, or very passionate, resistance to getting married in America. It's just not, I don't see that. But in China, it's very, it can be very militant actually. But there's a wide range of opinions among young women. So you have, I would say most of the young women who don't want to get married, um, it's not, as you were saying earlier, it's not because they don't want a partner. You know, they would like, to have a partner who really believes in them, who would share all of the household duties equally, who would support them in their career dreams or educational dreams. Um, But so many of these young women haven't found a partner like that. And so they say, well, why should I marry them? I mean, of course I shouldn't marry. And they're making the correct decision. And they also don't want to have a child yet, um, or some of them say when they're very young, uh, and I've definitely interviewed women who are very young in their early, or their mid twenties who say, that's it. There is no way I am ever going to marry or have a child because marriage is a living hell. Marriage in China is a living hell. It's just a patriarchal trap. And it doesn't even matter who the partner is, that the whole institution traps women. And this is something that is not entirely unique to China, but almost. It's rare to be trapped to this degree in a marriage in China because now the government has made it so difficult to get a divorce. Um, but, But the thing is, you know, that the, these, these um, beliefs, misogynistic beliefs, um, sexist beliefs, that it's the woman's job to just maintain harmony in the home. It's the woman's natural job to do all the housework, do all the cooking, you know, take care of the children. These, are, these kinds of gendered beliefs and these traditional gender norms are virtually universal actually they are very universal and that's why in conversations when women say oh, i got married and i lost myself we for you we can use the word trapped it's just that you get married and some for some for so many women whose partners do not support their dreams you lose focus of who you are and what you have intended to be before marriage things would change and if you do not have a partner that's constantly supporting you to get degrees to go to school to empower yourself it would be really hard i miss all of the house chores and domestic and child care you have to do so I mean, it'll be really, it'll be, so it's unfair to actually say to a woman that she's left over. She's saying, you know what? I want to be partnered, but it has to make sense with someone that makes sense. And until I find that, I will remain single. And this, and this brings me to the conversation of pay gap. Your book highlights how property laws in China contributes to a wealth gap and increases women's dependency on men. Do you see a way to close this gap in the future? Yes. So this really is unique to China. And this is something I studied a lot uh, and wrote a lot about in my book, Leftover Women, is that because um, China has had this really hot real estate boom 
that has driven uh, economic growth for uh, uh, it's it's played a major role in economic growth in the last few decades. Um, that uh, one of the trends that was very pronounced a dec one decade ago when I started doing my research was that um, women were really shut out of the accumulation of of residential real estate wealth through several ways. One was that the parents of daughters sadly really discriminated against their own daughters. So parents were by and large a decade ago extremely unwilling to help their daughters buy a home. And, um, and if the daughter had a brother, then the parents would help the brother buy a home and they wouldn't help the daughter. And this was seen by these young women who had brothers uh, who were getting financial help from their parents, but they weren't getting the financial help. You know, a lot of these women just said, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, there's nothing I can do about it. And yes, I want to buy my own home, but I can't afford it because my parents aren't helping me. Um, even, even some cases where parents <laughs> only had one child and their child was a daughter, I found quite a few examples, unfortunately, of parents helping their nephew buy a home and saying, still saying no to their daughter because the norm in China that the man is supposed to be head of the household and he's supposed to own a home, um, that that norm is so strong that many parents discriminated even against their own daughters. So that meant that women, the, the younger generation who wanted to buy their own home, really had to do it on their own. Now, obviously there are exceptions. Sometimes parents would help their daughters and buy a home for them. But um, this plays into another unique kind of pressure in China, which is that marriage and home buying go hand in hand in China. That when you get married, the norm is you're supposed to have your own marital home. And there's another gendered belief that is incorrect that I, I researched, that men cannot find a bride unless the men own a home. But this is really untrue, actually, especially in the big cities, because I found um, so many women were helping these men buy homes. And then the homes would be registered only in the man's name. And so the woman would just give away all of her hard earned life savings. And it was painful for me to see this as uh, a researcher. Um, and I kept asking, every time I encountered this, I kept asking the woman I interviewed, you know, why, if she hadn't married yet, because a lot of times she hadn't married, why do you feel like you have to marry this man? Why are you willing to give him your entire life savings? You know, why don't you just walk away? Um, but at that time, 10 years ago, society hadn't, it hadn't taken hold yet that women could really walk away en masse from from an unequal relationship um, but today things are really changing quite dramatically so i already talked about how a, millions of young women in china are saying no to intense marriage and child rearing pressure so many women are saying that that the birth rates and the marriage rates have fallen conspicuously another change is that you do see more single women buying homes of their own. And that means that the home is registered in their own name. Unfortunately, unfortunately, um, China's real estate boom is over. So those women, I mean, it's still better that these women are able to afford to buy their own homes. Uh, prices have come down somewhat, a little bit, but not that much. They're still uh, extremely unaffordable um, given, you know, the median income for a Chinese consumer. So, 
But the only way, and through all the research I did, I thought that, well, okay, what if a woman jointly owns a home with her husband? Then at least she gets, if they divorce, you know, at least she gets half of the home's value. Unfortunately, that's not even true because the courts are so, and this, again, this comes from the very top of the Chinese government. They're, they're, these judges refuse to give women to grant women a divorce at a divorce trial. Um, and if the women are determined to divorce, they have to go through an entire trial, lose the trial, and then they have to file a second divorce lawsuit to stand a chance of being granted a divorce. Um, meanwhile, the, most divorces, even when the property is jointly owned, property goes to the man. And so does the custody of the child or children, especially if the child or the children are boys. And so this is another way in which things have come become much more dire for women's rights over the last decade. But on the other hand, the really good thing is that there are more women finding ways to resist individually, to either say, no, I'm not going to marry or have a child to begin with. I mean, maybe they'll have a long-term partner, but they don't want to enter into this marital institution under which women's rights are simply not protected in the marriage institution in China. Um, but in terms of keeping your property wealth as a woman, you have to register the home solely under your own name. And that is not easy to do because these homes are really expensive. But if the home is in your name only, then even the Chinese courts recognize, well, you're the owner. <laughs> so that's the only way you can really guarantee your property rights. But you, you can't even have a jointly owned property unless, of course, the partner agrees. Unless your partner is very, you know, uh, considerate and agrees to give you your half of the property. But unfortunately, there are so many couples where that's just not the case, where the man refuses to let the woman divorce him and refuses to give her, you know, her share of the property or even custody of the the child in many cases. All of this is so unfair and to think we have so many parents supporting nephews and sons, where does that leave your daughters? Because the thing with having to buy a house in your name is, I mean, we can have this conversation without saying, talking about dependency on men and domestic violence when a person has so much power or when power has been given to them and they know that, okay, this place is mine, you're depending on me financially the chances of financial and economic abuse is high. So what happens to women who are going through that kind of abuse, also knowing that they probably do not have a place they can call home because so many parents end up helping nephews and sons. Uh, it, it's really heartbreaking. Like so many women's stories all over the world, they may not be the same, but there's always some similarities. And it feels like women will keep fighting for their rights every single day in every institution, in the religious space, workplace even in the marital institution it's just so heartbreaking you don't want to be called leftover woman you're trying to put in the work of you're trying to then get married and we have all of this injuries i mean it's it's just so heartbreaking it's so heartbreaking it is really heartbreaking but i have to add that um i actually feel very encouraged in china by the the recent development of really millions of young educated women who recognize that society is very sexist because 10 years ago more than 10 years ago when i was doing research that was not the case it wasn't the women that i interviewed 10 years ago or more um, when i was originally doing this research a lot of them felt hopeless that these were women who had not married yet and this is where the hope lies if you haven't married yet you can control you decide if you're going to marry or have a baby 
that's up to you. Nobody, as yet, nobody can force you to marry or have a baby. I mean, you know, unless we talk about abortion bans, um, which we see in, in America now, um, and that is a huge problem. And this is where, again, the government plays a really strong role. But in China so far, abortion is not yet banned. But I think, um, you know, in the future, we'll see because the government is so determined to push young women into getting married and having babies that, you know, we just don't know. It, they may ban abortion. They've already made it really difficult to get a vasectomy. It's very, very difficult now. And this is a recent development in China. So that's less controversial than abortion restrictions in China. Um, but, but the thing is, I am very heartened by this new trend of young women in China saying, I don't have to play this game. I'm not going to get married. And, and in fact, even some young women who have found somebody they really love and want to be their partner, even some of those women are saying they don't want to get married, that it's fine with them to just have a long-term relationship, but they don't want to enter into that legal contract because that legal contract or the institution of marriage in China at any rate is really a, a trap because they, they can't get out of it. And then you get into property ownership, you know, custody of children. Um, but if you don't, if you don't get married, you know, that's a decision. That's an individual taking control of her destiny. And I didn't see a lot of that. 10 years ago, I definitely saw some of it. I mean, there were very militant young women who were very militant feminists and said, I'm never going to marry. Um, because, you know, marriage is a trap. But that was the exception 10 years ago. Today, there are so many women, it's much more common to just say, you know what? I don't care how much pressure you put me under. I'm not doing it. I'm the one who gets to make the decision. And that to me really gives me hope because I think even in uh, an autocracy, that is so tightly controlled, where you don't have press freedom, you don't have internet freedom, you don't have freedom of assembly in China. But this is one area where the personal is truly political in China. The, a young woman deciding to make a personal decision not to marry, um, that's a political decision actually. Collectively, when you have many, millions and millions of young women in China making that same kind of decision, then it becomes a political form of pressure on the government. And, and that really does give me hope. Whereas 10 years ago, I felt, why, why aren't these women walking away from an unequal relationship? I wish they would walk away. And today, more and more of them are walking away. So what you said about uh, young women becoming more enlightened and demanding for equal rights. It's the same actually in Nigeria because you see a lot of young women, you see 18 year old, 19 year olds, they are very, very, they're aware. very aware and they're very, um, they're very, they're standing on business for their feminism. They are, they're, they're, not, they're not playing around. You call, you call them militant feminists. Yes. Uh, that's the way they are also here. So it, it, it gives us hope that we have younger people who are, who believe in the equality or the, the humanity of themselves and they are working they are fighting hard to make sure that people know this i know a lot of young people who have said a lot of young women who have talked about not getting married or having children it's it's and they're young 20 21 they're saying these things so it's i think for me it gives me hope that we have younger people coming behind us who are secure in their humanity and they just want people to know that I'm, I'm equal to any man out there so it's really very um very inspiring very amazing so um so we'd like to 
this conversation has been very enlightening. It's been really enlightening. Thank you for coming. And so let's ask you, what words would you leave with our listeners? What are your final words to our listeners out there? I would say, you know, be true to yourself. I think this is really important, especially young women who are getting this intense pressure to do something that, you know, they really don't want to do, but they feel like they're not going to be a good daughter or, you know, a lot of it is pressure from your own parents, at least in China. Admittedly, I haven't read a lot about the situation in Nigeria, but I would it's imagine. The same here. Yes, it's right, the same here. That the, the most difficult kind of pressure, I think, is when it comes from your own mother or father, who, especially if you have a good relationship with them and you really love them, and your beloved parents are telling you, you're causing us pain by doing this. Why are you? hurting us in this way why don't you do the right thing and find you know a nice man or or don't be so picky <laughs> and just get married because you're causing us pain and and you know the thing is it's not your fault the young women you know it's your life it's your life to lead and you only have one life and i yes you're young but um, it's very important to do what you want to do, be true to yourself. And, and in any case, even if you have found somebody you really love, be careful. Don't, you don't need to rush into marriage. Um, so, but, be, but it is, you know, it's a very, unfortunately, still a very sexist world and marriage and then having children can be something that uh, you can't foresee the consequences, but because it's a very sexist world, you know, it becomes much more difficult to be true to yourself later. So just take your time and do what you want to do. And, you know, you don't have to succumb to all of that pressure. That's what I would say. Thank you later for sharing your insights and experiences with us today. Your work continues to inspire and educate many around the world. To our listeners, we hope this conversation has enlightened you and sparked a desire for change. Remember to subscribe to the Counter Narrative for more thought provoking episodes. You can follow us on Instagram at the Counter Narrative Podcast and on Twitter at the CN underscore podcast. Bye.